In the last episode, I spent nearly $1 million on a 3D printer in an attempt to fix the housing crisis. Now that million dollars I spent, that's already on top of the $1.4 million that we've already spent on the land that we're gonna use the printer on. The printer arrived and we printed the first ever 3D print from a maxi printer in Canada. That is the first line ever. Now today, we're gonna learn what happens when innovation clashes with regulations. So it looks like we're finally in a place to build homes faster, cheaper, and smarter. We've talked to some people in the development world to hear if our plan is a viable one. We've seen some of the technology that can rapidly speed up the way we build firsthand. And we've learned how to optimize our workflow to eliminate some of the time consuming and cost inflating barriers in planning and logistics. Things can only get so far with just theory alone. So I set up a meeting with the team so that we could get into gear to actually start building. We've been researching this project now for almost two months and Shahid just applied for zoning and some of the feedback isn't good. And we got to think about what we're going to do. Oh, this is a lot of money that we're going to spend on these pieces of technology for this building. What are you suggesting? The feedback that we're getting from zoning is how is this building going to be made with the technology that you are planning to make it with. It's not tested at the city. The city has no specs. The city has got no understanding of the capacity of the 3D frame that is going to hold. And then we are even talking about using fiberglass reinforcement. That has never been used either. So we will be facing a lot of questions and we have to be ready to give answers to them, an absolute understanding of how this thing needs to be placed that site. What Shahid is actually getting at is if we want the new methods of building approved, we're going to have to start to answer all of the city's questions of whether or not this is safe and passes code and a million other things. So when that time comes, we'll need to be ready. But the conundrum is that it's never been done before. Combining multiple methods into one building, that'd be a first. And some of these methods, they've never even been done in Canada. So we're not even gonna get the answers. Okay. So we're gonna have to come up with, we're gonna have to come up with a solution to this because I'm not gonna lie to you, obviously this is a lot of money that we're gonna be spending on these, on this first actual building that's gonna go up. And one of the things that Mo was saying to me was, what if we looked at something smaller, like a test case? that we could maybe try and act on faster than the larger six-story building, but is still gonna be able to give us the same use of technology on some of the products that we're looking at. I mean, what if we try to do that first? But you have to remember that between the zoning and getting the permit, we have a one-year period during which we have to get the permits. Otherwise, the zoning lapses. So that one-year period that we have, we have to collect all the our stuff, and give it to the city and see that the zoning doesn't expire. We'll have to go through the whole cycle again. Shahid mentioned zoning. And zoning is just a small piece of a giant puzzle when it comes to building. But to explain exactly what has to happen in order to build a building, well, we're going to need our cartoon friends. But before we do that, one thing, I'm going to need you to do something for me. I'm going to need you to hammer that subscribe button. Okay, now that's out of the way, let's get going. Sometimes a city or neighborhood needs more places to live. Maybe there aren't enough apartments or rent keeps going up. Once the need is clear, the developer thinks about what kind of building would fit. Should it be condos, rental apartments, or maybe mixed use? In our case, it's a prototype to finally be able to build homes affordably, but still maintain its coolness. Next comes finding the land. Real estate agents look for a parcel that is big enough and located near roads, schools, or public transit. The chosen lot should also match the type of building planned. Now the challenge is, every piece of land has rules about what you can build there. These are called zoning rules. You're gonna to wanna to pay close attention to this because this is what's causing us the biggest problem right now. Zoning tells you things like how tall or wide a building can be, how many homes it can have, how far it must sit from the street, and where to put parking. These rules keep neighborhoods orderly and safe. The developer and their team 
Read these rules carefully to see whether the plan building fits. If it fits, they can continue. If not, they need to rethink the design or ask for an exception. There are two types of changes, a minor variance, which is a small adjustment like adding an extra story and a rezoning, which is a larger change to the land use. In our case, our zoning was actually approved. But in order for us to pass code, we're going to have to prove to the city now that it's safe before our zoning expires. And well, you'll see how that unfolds. A committee reviews these requests by asking whether the change is reasonable, maintains the intent of the rules, and it is good for the community. Neighbors can even share their views, and the committee decides whether to approve the request. This step helps balance new ideas with community needs. And this new idea is that, what, our community has affordable housing? And not just foofy, empty promises, but real solutions. Some land sits near rivers, lakes, or wetlands. These are protected because they manage floods and support wildlife. Conservation authorities check projects in these zones to ensure they won't harm watercourses, wetlands, or valley lands. Other sites may have heritage buildings, tall trees, or public parks. Developers must follow the rules of heritage boards, parks, departments, or forestry agencies. By speaking with these groups early, they make sure that the project respects nature and history. With the land rules understood, architects and engineers create detailed plans. These show how the building will look, how it will stand up safely, and how mechanical systems, water, heating, cooling, and electricity will work. The developer submits these plans to the building department to request a building permit. This is kind of where we're at. In order for us to build our six-story building, we're going to have to get these guys on board with us. And then, unfortunately, I don't think this is going to come easy. I'm thinking the best way, well, it's just to prove it. But before we get there, let's just continue with the roadmap. For us to move forward with our design, the building department must review the submitted plans in several stages. You have zoning compliance. This is where officials verify that the design follows the zoning rules and any special regulations. Building code compliance, where specialists check the structure, fire protection, and accessibility meet national or regional building codes. Building codes are adopted to ensure all buildings meet minimum safety and structural standards. Mechanical Systems Review, where another team examines plumbing, heating, and ventilation to ensure they are designed safely and efficiently. And finally, Fire Prevention Review, where fire safety experts review sprinkler and alarm systems and check that the emergency exits are well designed. If inspectors find any issues, the design team revises the plans, and when everything meets the rules, the building department issues a building permit, signaling that the construction may begin. Once the permit is granted and the technologies are approved, construction begins. Workers pour foundations, build frames, and add walls and install systems. Throughout the process, inspectors visit to ensure the work follows the approved plans and building codes. When all stages pass inspection and the building is complete, doors will open and people can move into their new homes. This all has to happen because building a multi-story home isn't just about bricks and beams. It's about following a clear process that respects local rules and protects special places so we can deliver homes that are both safe and well-designed. That's the story of construction disruption. We're gonna show you firsthand that this is not as easy as it sounds, and it gets even harder when you try and change the game like we are. So what you're saying basically is the race is on. I think the city will be happy with your suggestion of going small. The city will get a good handle of this new research stuff. The whole housing system benefits from it, actually. Also, I agree with the Shaheed because, you know, when you have a one small building, it will be help us to what we cost in perspective that you want to get to. Okay, well, then I guess that's what we got to do. We're going to have to look for another building and we're going to have to figure out how we can make this on a smaller scale first, then move into that larger building at the same time. So we're going to have two of them going at the same time. That's pretty adventurous, boys. For the record, guys, I'm not made of money. This is seriously starting to add up. We just dropped over a million dollars on a piece of property and nearly another million dollars for a 3D printer. And now we got to find another property to buy just so we can test all this stuff out. You guys better be helping me out with the subscribe buttons or I'm not gonna be able to eat soon. I now have to decide on what kind of property I'm looking to buy in order to test this out. And just as I was weighing my options, we struck some luck. Just to give you a good news, Toronto have accepted six flexes without any committee of adjustments. So this saves us almost three to six months. These projects can be 
gone ahead with instantly. Okay, so what you're telling me is, is that we literally can go and find a project now and not have to wait for committee, which means that while we're still planning our six story structure, we're gonna be able to find a property where we can test out these products. This is crazy. This is like, this couldn't have happened at a better time. So that gives us a big boost in time, as well as so it saves you a lot of money as well. Oh man, the hunt is on again. We gotta look for new property, okay. All right, well, let's get ourselves organized and I'll start looking for stuff that we can find in those areas and then you're gonna have to tell me which ones are the best ones to choose. Finally, I got some good news and it gave me all the energy I needed to keep the momentum on this. I'm super, super pumped. And finally, we get to start building. I know I've already said this twice in this episode, but you're really gonna wanna subscribe this time if you haven't done so. Because next week, we're gonna go through the shopping process and reveal the costs if we were to build with this modern tech. And you're not gonna wanna miss that. I mean, we just dropped a million dollars on the property. We dropped another million dollars on a 3D printer. And now we're gonna have to find another property to buy just to test all this out. Whoa, blue. Great to screw up. Giant puzzle when it comes to actually building. And to explain this without saying explain, because I just screwed up the explaining. In our case, it's a prototype for us to finally be able to build homes affordably and be pretty cool. And I got an itchy nose. And You'll see how that unfolds. <laughs> oh my god, I'll be fighting that. Oh cough god. So I'll be fighting that cough so bad. <laughs> I was like, bad. what are you doing? I, mean, I like this. <laughs> Foofies are new, are new spoofy. Exactly. All right. And that new idea, well, that what? Our community actually has affordable housing and not just some foofy wishful thinking that maybe we might uh, turn something into a reality, but real promises, not empty solutions. <laughs> I that up too.